subsequent to the first use of antibiotics, many different antibiotics, including penicillin, have been discovered and used and saved millions of lives as a result. The modern era of microbiology isn't just about using drugs to kill microbes, but also entails the better understanding of the molecular mechanisms of bacteria and all life on Earth as well. In particular, the discovery of DNA and its structure has allowed microbiologists to better manipulate microorganisms and study them for eventual cures. The first study or experiment to demonstrate the importance of DNA, the molecule itself, was done by Frederick Griffith at the beginning of the 1900s. In it, he was again studying streptococci, much like Alexander Fleming. And in studying this bacterial infection, he noticed that there were two different types of strains that were visibly distinguishable on a Petri plate. One, called S for smooth, had a glossy cover to it, while the other, R for rough, did not. The smooth strain, when injected into a laboratory animal, would cause death, whereas the R strain, when injected into a laboratory man, ma animal, would not make that animal sick at all. These are referred to as a virulent or disease-causing strain and an avirulent or non-disease-causing strain. Interestingly, Frederick Griffith discovered that when a dead S strain were mixed with a living R strain, and injected into an animal, the animal would also die. He then extracted the bacteria in that dead animal and found that the bacteria that caused the infection was in fact a living S strain. How could a dead S strain and a living R strain turn into a living S strain? Did the living R strain somehow cause the S strain that was dead to revive and become alive again, like a zombie? After subsequent studies, Frederick Griffith discovered that what happened was that the living R strain, in fact, was turned into a living S strain by an, a mechanism that was not well understood. This process is now known as transformation because it changes one strain into another. Sixteen years later, in the mid-1900s, Oswald Avery and his research lab investigated what molecular component of the dead S strain was responsible for converting the R strain into an S strain. He took the protein portion of the dead S strain and mixed it with the living R strain, the sugar or carbohydrate component in a separate test tube and mixed it with the living R strain. In a third test tube, he mixed nucleic acid, DNA and RNA into a test tube with the living R strain. And notice that the only one of those three where he got the disease symptoms and a dead mouse was when he mixed nucleic acids, indicating that the transforming principle, the molecule for transforming or changing that living R strain into an S strain was a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. Following those studies, he took enzymes DNase and RNase and use them to selectively destroy either DNA or RNA. 
when he used DNase to destroy DNA molecules and retained RNA, the RNA plus the living R strain did nothing and the mouse still remained alive. But RNase enzymes mixed with the nucleic acid component would destroy all of the RNA, keeping all of the DNA intact, and that again was able to generate the disease symptoms and a dead mouse, indicating that the molecule responsible for transforming the R strain into the S strain was DNA. There was still some debate about the importance of the DNA molecule because it looked too simplistic to transfer such an important property. This is where Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase in the mid 1900s came along and definitively showed that it was the DNA and no other molecule responsible for this transformation principle. They did not use two different bacterial strains, one living and one dead. Instead, they used a bacteriophage strain, a viral strain, bacteriophage T4, to infect E. coli, a different type of bacterial cell. They had two different types of bacteriophage, one with radioactively labeled sulfur and another one that had radioactively labeled phosphorus. The thing about sulfur and phosphorus is that sulfur is found only in proteins and not in DNA or RNA at all. And phosphorus is found only in DNA and RNA and not found in proteins at all. So this was again a, a way of distinguishing between the use of proteins or nucleic acids. Now it just so happened that bacteriophage are only comprised of proteins and DNA. There's no RNA or sugars or any other molecules. It's a very simplistic structure because it's a viral particle. What they found was the resulting offspring of the bacteriophage, referred to as daughter phages, did not contain radioactive sulfur, but they did contain radioactive phosphorus, indicating that the DNA was the molecule of heredity and not proteins. Combined, Oswald Avery and Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase's experiments indicate and show support for the evidence that DNA is not just the molecule of information, but also the molecule of heredity. It is the molecule you acquire from your parents, as well as being the molecule that provides information to make a cell a cell. With the understanding that DNA is then such an important molecule in so many, and now we know, all cells on Earth, scientists began investigating what its structure looked like at the molecular level. The structure of DNA was discovered by James Watson, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins. James Watson and Francis Crick were working in England at the time. They both had a theoretical model of the structure of DNA, but no scientific evidence to show the structure was in fact true. Science works by providing evidence and data in support of a theory or a hypothesis. And while Jim Watson and Francis Crick had a great idea, they did not have much scientific evidence. That's where Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins comes in. Rosalind Franklin's specialty was to take highly detailed images of molecules using X-ray radiation. 
She would shine x-ray rays on molecular structures and take actual photos of what these molecules looked like. While she took photos of the molecules themselves, she didn't have the ability necessarily to understand exactly how the photos translate to a 3D molecular structure. Jim Watson and Francis Crick were so convinced that their 3D model was correct, they tried to get Rosalind Franklin's images for 2D pictures to provide support for their 3D model. But she was not very forthcoming. So instead, Maurice Wilkins snuck in and showed James Watson and Francis Crick the images that she took. With this support, they were able to publish their findings and were the first individuals to hypothesize the structure of DNA as a double helix. The double helix structure basically looks like a ladder with two backbone structures and rungs or steps of the ladder in between. This ladder is then twist, twisted or coiled, and that's why it's referred to as a double helix. Rosalind Franklin unfortunately died an untimely death at the age of 37 as a result of cancer. Some people speculate this could be a result of her ongoing work with X-ray radiation. But because of her early death, she was not able to share in the Nobel Prize that Watson and Crick won for their model of the structure of DNA. Instead, Wilkins shared the prize to demonstrate the importance of Rosalind Franklin's images. Images of molecules aren't the only important molecular advance. In fact, the electron microscope was also an important imaging equipment that allowed scientists to view molecules, including structures like viruses. Here we have an electron micrograph of the Ebola virus and of the herpes simplex virus that causes genital and oral herpes. Electron micrographs allow us to see structures that light microscopes cannot see. Because they use electrons, they are always in black and white and gray. And the images you see in your textbook are in fact artificially colored by an artist. Even more recent advancements of molecular biology that allow scientists to manipulate molecules is the use of restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are protein enzymes that can cut specific regions of DNA. When this is followed by a different enzyme called ligase, that allows different pieces of DNA to be glued together. Restriction enzymes you could think of as scissors and ligase as glue or tape. And combined, these two different enzymes allow scientists to generate any number of different types of DNA molecules that can be inserted into living systems and used for things like genetic engineering, where we insert any number of different types of DNA molecules into living systems. Finally, another type of molecular biology tool that is exceedingly useful in today's hospitals and medical microbiology is polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This invention allows scientists to make copies of a specific region of DNA in a short period of time. This is used every day today to identify infectious disease and diagnose infections in hospitals, to screen for genetic disorders, and also in forensic studies from samples from a crime scene, or even to identify paternity or who the father is of a child. That's it for chapter two.